ask if you would to bow with me in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we do praise you for your faithfulness. And we can sing that with confidence, knowing that absolutely every part of that is true. And God, I am so thankful that you are here with us today. Now I pray that you'd bless the preaching of your word and that we would receive it as the word of God and that we would give you our undivided attention and immediate obedience. Lord, we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I'm going to ask if you would to go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of James. For those of you who may be guests with us here today, I have been in a series in the book of James now for, well, some time. And uh, we are in chapter 5, and the title of this series is Common Sense Christianity. And, I, and I'm going to tell you something. I have been truly blessed in many ways myself as a result of these messages. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how pride produces contention. And then last week, we talked about how arrogance is offensive to God. And this week, we're going to talk about how covetousness corrupts. Being a person who is consumed by a, or consumed with a covetous nature, that's going to, that's going to corrupt you. And so uh, you can tell by the, the title of these messages that it's very practical. These are things that we ought to know as Christians. We ought to know that pride produces contention within relationships. We ought to know that. We ought to know that arrogance, when we are arrogant, and we fail to seek God, we ought to know that that is offensive to the Lord because the Lord wants us to seek Him in everything, correct? And this morning, we ought to know that covetousness corrupts. I mean, the Bible says, thou shalt not covet. And when we covet and we long for, uh, for things of this world and we're not content with what God's blessed us with, and if we're not using what God has blessed us with for His glory, then we're gonna, it's going to corrupt us. And the very things that we're hoarding, the very things that we're coveting, will be the very things that stand against us on the day of judgment. All right? And that's what James teaches us this morning. And so let's go ahead and read from James. James chapter 5, and we're going to read there in verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 6. So James says, Come now, you rich. Come now, you rich people. Weep and well over the miseries that are coming on you. Your wealth is ruined, and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your silver and your gold are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and you will eat your flesh like fire. Your stored-up treasure in the last days. Let me read that again. He says, Your silver and gold are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you. And will eat your flesh like fire. You stored up treasure in the last days. Look. The pay that you withheld from your workers who reaped your fields cries out. And the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived luxuriously on the land and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous man, and he does not resist you. Okay, and I've had this about just as long as I can, so goodness gracious. All right. So, I mean, clearly this passage of Scripture deals with covetousness. As I was preparing this sermon, I was thinking about a story that I heard one day of a, of a man who was lost in the desert. And I want you to hear this story. The man was lost in the desert. He was without water. But he saw an old shack in the distance. He was close to, de close to death, and he knew that he didn't have a lot of time left. But he did everything that he could, and he made his way to the shack. When he got to the shack, he noticed a clear, I mean a crystal clear jar of water sitting there in the shack. However, there was a note attached to the jar of the water. And the note said this, use the jar of water to prime the pump in the back. And when you have 
drink when you have when you have when you are satisfied with 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 everything that you've consumed, then fill the jar with water and place it there for the next person. Well, here's this man. Now he's faced with a dilemma. What's he going to do? I mean, he's dying of thirst. Is he going to immediately drink the water? Or is he going to use the water that is provided for him to prime the pump, which would provide him with even more water? But not only would it provide him with even more water, it would, it would, it would, be, uh, it would help the next person who would be coming behind him. Now, at the end of this me message, I'm going to tell you what the man did. But right now, what I want you to think about is this. Is I truly believe that we live in a society today where we, where we would drink the water. In other words, we wouldn't use the water to prime the pump. Because we don't think about eternal things often. Or we don't think about other people. Tragically, I believe that covetousness is one of the most uh, common sins among the American culture. And it has made its way into the church. Let us be reminded that James is writing this to the church. He's writing this to Jewish believers who have been converted to Christianity. And he is sternly rebuking them for using their wealth and means that are, uh, that are dishonoring to the Lord. And not only is he writing this to rebuke the wealthy, but he's also writing this to encourage the poor who are being oppressed by the rich. Now the reason the now here's the way the poor are being oppressed. They're being oppressed because the rich are failing to provide the poor with what they need. You see, that's something that I want us to understand today. That this message applies to everyone in this congregation. You see. If we were living in the day that James wrote this, we would be considered rich. If we were to live today like they were living then, in other words, if you had the same finances, the same home, and the same everything that you have right now, but yet you were living then, you would be considered rich. And not only that, consider to, uh, in relation to most of the world, we are rich. And so I want you to know that this message applies to all of us. Because every person in here, God has blessed you with some means of wealth. God has blessed you with the material things that you have. Now God has blessed us with these things so that we will use what we have in order to serve Him. And when we use what we have to serve God, God blesses us with more and others who are around us are blessed. It's like using the water to prime the pump. Here's a blessing. And I could drink it. I could take what I have and I could drink it for myself. And I could use it for my own self-indulgence. Or I could use it to prime the pump, which is going to produce more water. And not only that, not only will it be a blessing to me, it will be a blessing to the person who's coming after me. You see, that's exactly what God wants us to do with the material things that we have. That's exactly what God wants us to do with our wealth. God's blessed you with what you have. And He wants you to use what you have to prime the pump. And God says, listen, if you'll use what you have to prime the pump, I'm going to bless you with more. And not only will I bless you with more because you're being faithful with what I've given you. And when you're faithful with the small things, I'm going to trust you with more things. And so because of your faithfulness and you're using what you have to be a blessing to be a blessing to me, I'm going to bless you with more. And therefore, you're going to be a blessing. And it's going to be a blessing to people who are coming behind you. Amen? But sadly, and the church is not exempt. Sadly, the church is taking a glass of water. We're taking what God has blessed us with, and, we're, and it's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about fulfilling my desires. I, I'm really not trying to offend anybody here today. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't peek into anybody's windows to see how you live, all right? That's kind of weird anyway, all right? But... And so I don't peek into anybody's windows to see how you live. And another thing I don't do is I don't, I don't look at the, the giving records to see what you give. I don't have a clue what you give. So you need to know that. Okay? 
I don't have a clue. And one of the reasons I don't look, and the, one of the reasons I don't have a clue is so that I can pre preach messages like this and you, and you not think I'm talking about you, all right? So I don't have a clue. But I've always found it interesting that people who have a problem with tithing or giving to the church on a regular basis, these are, the, these are people, I, well, I don't believe in tithing. But you know what? But they do believe in indulging. I, I, well, do you believe in indulging? You see, they, they don't believe in tithing, but yet they'll believe in, they'll believe in indulging the desi their own desires. And that's just like the man. Man, can you think about that guy who went to the shack? It would have been foolish for him just to grab the, 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 the jar of water and drink it, right? I mean, just to drink it. You know why that's foolish? Because there was more in the well. And he could have had greater satisfa satisfa satisfaction if he would have used the water to prime the pump. But if he just drinks the jar and doesn't use it to prime the pump, he's going to have temporary satisfaction and he's going to miss out on a greater blessing. And not only that, it really proves his heart, doesn't it? That he doesn't care about the person who's coming behind him. Praise God that there was someone who came before him who thought about the other person. But how foolish and how selfish it must, must be for that man to take what he has. He didn't earn it. It was a gift. It was given to him. He didn't deserve it. To take what he has, to indulge it in himself, and not use it to prime the pump and not think about anybody else. Are you, do you have the illustration by now? I hope you got it. And I hope that that's not the way you're living. I, I pray that you realize that everything that you have and everything that God's blessed you with is for His glory. And God has blessed you with what you have because He wants to use it to impact lostness. If you're a Christian, God has given you what you have in order to see people saved. God has given you what you have in order to fund the ministry, in order to fund the ministry of the church. God has given you and blessed you with what you have in order to see that the needs of other people, that other people's needs are met. And this is not just a sermon for adults, teenagers. You have things. You have things. There's things that, that you have that, that other kids don't have. And, and this message is for you. You just need to think about it. What is it that I have that God has blessed me with that I in turn could take and use to bless someone else? You see, we have to guard ourselves from coveting. Always wanting more and never being satisfied. I always want more. It's all about me. This impulsive desire. We're driven by impulse, aren't we? I mean, we, we see something and we don't even need it, but we like it. And so we buy upon We Often we're guilty of buying. A, 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 we're impulsive buyers. We see something. We have the means of getting it. So we just get it. And we don't even stop to think, God, stop and pray. And say, God, yes, I have the means of getting that. And yes, I would like it. But God, maybe you're wanting me to take what I have and use it to bless somebody else. Instead of getting from you, God, perhaps you're wanting me to give. And listen, God blesses us generously so that we'll give generously. Covetousness corrupts. I, I want to make a couple of points this morning. Let's talk about how covetousness corrupts. Number one, covetousness produces hoarding. How many of you like to show hoarders? How many of y'all think that's disgusting? Okay, well, put yourself in God's pos pos uh, position when he looks down here upon us. Often, and then there may be some hoarders in here. There may be some hoarders. I'm talking about people who actually have, you know what I mean, where they have trails going from one room to the other. Um, and you can't walk. And maybe there's some people in here like that. I, I don't know. I'm not looking down on you because in a, to one degree or to another, we're all guilty of hoarding. Are you understanding me? I guarantee you, listen, when I was preaching this message, I told Kelly, I walked to her, I said, Kelly, I've, I've, I've got a hoarding problem, <laughs> okay? And I had to go into my closet, yes, with a black trash bag, and I filled up two black trash bags full of clothes I haven't worn a year or two. 
you know what? Am I, am I going to let them hang there and gather dust? Or could somebody else be using those? Could somebody else be blessed by those? Yeah. I mean, I've got clothes that I, that I might get in again, you know, if I, if I lose a little weight. I think I'm... Some of you got that. You've got clothes that you've been... Listen, how long... Listen, if, it's, if they've been hanging there for a year and, or two years, you're not getting in them, okay? I'm not, I mean, I want to encourage you the best I can, but give it up, all right? Put them in a bag, take them to Goodwill, to the Salvation Army, and let somebody else use them. And so I had those type of clothes, and then I had some, what I called my fat boy britches. And those were, those were pants I had when I was a little bit bigger. And I thought, well, one of these days I might want to keep these because you never know. But I thought, no, I'm getting rid of those too, right? So I got rid of the ones that I hadn't wore because I'd outgrown, and I got rid of the ones that I couldn't wear because they were too big. And, and I filled up two trash bags, and here's the thing. What was I doing? That is a, that is a form of hoarding. When, when we have things that we're not using, that other people could be using and be blessed by, but we don't give them up, that is a form of hoarding. And you know why we do that? You know what that proves? That proves a covetous nature. Some people would say, well, I grew up in the Great Depression. Now, listen, I didn't, so I, I didn't grow up in that. But I know, well, I grew up in the Great Depression, and so this is just something that it, it's, because I grew up in that time, because I grew up in that time, I have a tendency to do these type of things. no. You do it because you uh, have a covetousness nature. That's why you do it. Okay? That's why we all do it. We can blame it and we can try to rationalize it away. But the, at the end of the day, the reason that we accumulate so many things that we don't need is because we have a covetousness nature. And coveting produces hoarding. And it's foolish. Because all we're doing is feeding moths. Does that make sense? To feed moths? Look at what he says. Verse 5, chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich people, weep and well over the miseries that are coming on you. I mean, that's a pronouncement of judgment. You understand? He says, your wealth is ruined and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your silver and your gold are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and you will, and will eat your flesh like fire. You stored up treasure in the last days. This passage is what we call in the theological world. Uh, it has an eschatological uh, meaning. In other words, it's pointing towards the end judgment. He's saying that you have all these things right now. You have your gold and you have your silver and you have all your clothes. And he says they're moth-eaten, they're corroded. In other words, he's rebuking them for hoarding. He says you're hoarding up all this stuff because, you're covet, because you have a problem with coveting. You're hoarding up all, these stu all this stuff and on the day of judgment, the very things that you're hoarding up, the very things that you're trusting in are going to be the very things that testify against you on the day of judgment. And if you are a believer, there's going to be a loss of reward on that day. And if you are an unbeliever, there is going to be a greater intensity of condemnation. Covetousness produces hoarding. Their garments are stored away and they become prey to the moth. Gold and silver bear on them the name of disuse. Some of your Bibles will say they rust. Now, we know that gold doesn't rust. And we know that silver may tarnish, but, but uh, it's not going to rust. So what does he mean here when he says that your gold and silver are going to rust? He's talking about how God sees them on the day of judgment. God will, God will see all the things that we've accumulated. All the things that we've hoarded up for ourselves. If we have failed to invest into the kingdom and all we do is accumulate for ourselves. He says the very things that you've accumulated are going to testify against you 
on the day of judgment. Now look at what else he says. Look at verse 3. He says, your silver and your gold are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you. And look here, and will eat your flesh like fire. What does that mean? He's saying that hoarding or coveting, which produces hoarding, will, will corrupt you. It will corrupt you. When he says, that's exactly what he's talking about. When he says, uh, it will eat your flesh like fire. It's going to corrupt you. It's like a poison. James is saying that, listen, from a heavenly point of view, man, if we hoard, then we are corrupting ourselves. And we're storing up, we're storing up uh, judgment for ourselves. Don't spend all your time trying to invest and to accumulate things that are going to rust up and things that are worthless. Now listen, is it, a prob- is, it, is it good to plan? Absolutely. Is it good to invest? I don't have a problem with investing towards your retirement. So I, I'm not saying, this is, by, this is not speaking against planning. This is, not, this is not speaking against saving, having a savings account. This is not speaking against uh, retirement. It's not speaking against those things. As a matter of fact, those things are good, and I would encourage those things. What it is speaking against is the overindulgence. And failing to realize that what you have, is, God doesn't bless you with what you have in order to indulge yourself. God has blessed you with what you have in order to bless the kingdom. To bless the kingdom. So I want you to evaluate your life this morning. And listen, we can make all types of excuses. And this is not a message that's necessarily meant to be on tithing, but we're going to deal with that. But, but here's the thing. We can make all excuses about why we, why we don't do this or, and all those type of things. But at the end of the day, that's all it is, is an excuse for not doing what God wants you to do. And for not, no, for not doing what you know you should do. So it may be that you have to do what I do and do some self-evaluation and say, man, what are some things I need to get rid of so that it can free me up to do what God wants? Covetousness produces hoarding. Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, listen, for where your treasure is, what? There your hearts will be also. He says that those who hoard and those who... Those who seek wealth, he says in the Proverbs, it, it, it's going to eat your flesh like a fire. Hoarding is a sign of mistrust. Accumulating things for yourself and failing to invest into the kingdom is a sign of mistrust. You're, you're, mistrust, you're, you're not trusting the Lord. You're trusting that your way is better than God's way. It's also a sign of spiritual short-sightedness. Because the Bible teaches us to think about the eternal and not the temporal, right? So why would I spend all my time here on earth storing up treasures here on earth? Accumulating things that are going to rust up and fade away. Doesn't it make more sense that I use what I have to focus on the eternal and not store up treasures for myself here on earth, which are going to corrupt wouldn't it, doesn't, doesn't wisdom say, spend your time here on earth investing in the kingdom so that you'll have eternal reward? Now, here's the way we, we, we fail to realize. We think about, we, we live like this earth is all there is. We live like this is it. But friends, this isn't it. This is temporary. 
When someone's lived 80 or 85 years or 90 or 95 years or Miss, Miss Hendricks's case, 105 years, we say, man, they've, she's been alive a long time. But Miss Hendricks, and, and 105, as you'll testify, is, sure, is, a very, is, a, is a blink of an eye in light of eternity. Don't live for the blink of the eye. Live for eternity. And how do we do that? We take what we have, all that God has blessed us with, and we use it for His glory. Now, does God mind if we have things? Absolutely not. I have things. I'm not speaking against that. Now, there'll be some preachers who get legalistic, and they'll tell you, boy, you can't have this, or you can't have that. You can't. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with people being wealthy. I don't have a problem with people having boats and all those things. I don't have a problem with that. As long as God's first. Amen? As long as you are honoring God with what you have. As long as you are investing what you have back into the kingdom. I don't have a problem with those things. God doesn't have a problem with those things. But here's what God has a problem with. Is when you neglect the kingdom so that you can have to, in order to indulge yourself. That type of attitude will stand against you as a testimony on the day of judgment. So what's the application? Learn to give. Learn to give. Discipline yourself to give. Well, I spent a little bit more time on that first point than I wanted to, so let me just move on to my second point. Covetousness promotes deceit. If, 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 if all you long for is wealth, and more and more and more and more, more stuff, it's going to promote deceit in your life. Because you are going to be deceitful and you're going to do deceitful things so that you can have, have more. A wife will run up a credit card without telling her husband. Why? Because she wants more and, it, and so therefore there's deceit. Or a husband will run up a credit card without talking to his wife. Why? He, and, so, and, and they try to hide it. And they, they play this hiding game of trying to hide it and keep it away from each other. Why? Because one or the other wanted more. Or they both wanted more. And really what we have is, what do we have? We have deceit. And why do we have deceit? Because of covetousness. Look at what he says. We see the hoarding there in verses 2 and 3. And now he says, look at, look at verse 4. Look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who reaped your fields cries out. And the outcry of the harvesters had reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived luxuriously on the land and have indulged yourself. So here are these landowners who have hired these farmers to work their land. And what are they doing? They're not paying them. Why are they not paying the workers what they owe? So that they can live what? Luxuriously. Do you see the deceit in that? They're withholding from others so that they can have more in order to indulge themselves so that they can live in luxury. And by the way, that term, you have lived in luxury, translates a verb that is found nowhere else in the Bible but right here. It points to an extravagant life, an extravagant comfort. Now, does the Lord mind us living in, in those types and, and, and having things that bring luxury and comfort? No, what he minds is this, is that when we have those things and they become a vice in our life. I have a, I have a recliner. It gives me some luxury. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I've got, a, I've got a big TV, flat screen. To, it gives me, I like watching the football games on that, right? So I don't, I don't want to be legalistic in this. You understand what I'm saying? But when those things become a vice, I'm not going to give. I'm not going to invest in the kingdom. I'm not going to prime the pump. I'm not going to think about other people. I'm going to withhold from doing what God wants me to do so that I can have more because I want to indulge my flesh so that I can have more Luxury. 
And he says, that is deceitful. You know why it's deceitful? Because God's saying, listen, I've blessed you with what you have. Because there's people in need. And if you don't use what you have for my glory, then you are oppressing those who are in need. America, we are the richest. Americans, we are the richest people on the face of the earth. God bless this nation. And Edmonites, got a little bit better than a lot of people in Oklahoma. Just tell it like it is. Why has God blessed America? Why has God blessed Edmund the way he has? Why has God blessed this church the way he has? So that we can hoard? So that we can indulge our flesh to live in luxury? Or so that we'll be faithful to invest it back in the kingdom? So that the poor are not oppressed. So that the lost will be saved. And so that the ministry of the church will be strengthened. Covetousness promotes deceit. The scripture says this in Proverbs 21. Making a fortune through a lying tongue is a, is a vanishing mist, a pursuit of death. If you seek to gain wealth through deceit, he says you are in the pursuit of death. Let that sink in for a moment. especially those who own businesses. If you seek to earn wealth through deceit, you are in the pursuit of death. Proverbs 13, 11, Wealth obtained by fraud will dwindle. Some of us may say this morning, we would say, Well, I have material wealth, but it was not obtained unrighteously. I worked hard for what I have, and I, because I worked hard for what I have, I have the right to use it the way I want. That reminds me of my favorite western, a scene in my favorite, one of my favorite westerns, Shenandoah with Jimmy Stewart. As a matter of fact, let's look at that scene right quick. Lord, we cleared this land, we plowed it, sowed it, and harvested, we cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be eating it if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We worked dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel, but we thank you just the same anyway, Lord, for this food we're about to eat. Amen. Lord, we've plowed this land. Lord, we've worked it. Lord, we've, do- we've worked doggone hard for everything that we have, and we wouldn't have it if we wouldn't have done it. But, Lord, in the same thing, we thank you anyway. Well, that's how we act. Listen, that's how we... we, we he, he voiced the way many live. He voiced how many live. Because most of us probably wouldn't voice it that way. We wouldn't say that. But that's how we live. If we don't take what we have and use it for the glory of God, that's exactly what we're saying. I have what I have because I went to school and I did it and I worked it and I invested and I took steps of I took I took risk and I have what I have because I worked up I wor- I rolled up my sleeves and therefore I'm not going to listen to some some preacher tell me. Hello, Jimmy. How you doing today? Jimmy Stewart, right? That's exactly the same thing that he would say. Now listen, we listen to that prayer and we're like, man, who's he praying to because he's not praying to God? Now Jimmy in that movie, he would take his family to church every Sunday. You see, before his wife died, he promised his wife he would take the kids to church. So every Sunday he was taking his kids to church. He was showing up. But he was giving himself the credit for everything that he had done. And he wasn't using what he had to invest back into the kingdom. All he was thinking about was the earthly and the temporal instead of the heavenly and the eternal. You see, covetousness 
Covetousness, as I told you, produces or promotes deceit. So what's the application? Be honest in all your dealings. Be honest. Be an honest person. Number three, covetousness pursues indulgence. Luxury itself is not a sin. I mean, you are sitting on padded pews. Correct? How many of you are thankful for that this morning? So luxury itself is not a sin. But it is a sin. It becomes a sin when luxury keeps us from ministering to those whom we are responsible for ministering. If you place your luxury over ministry, it is a sin. Verse 4, or look at verse 5. You have lived luxuriously on the land, and look here, and have indulged, indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. Some of you may have a hard time with that translation, understanding that those of us who were grown in the grew up in the country, we know what that means. When it's time, when it's time, when the when, when it's time to slaughter a, a heifer, you go out in the pasture, you're gonna you're gonna slaughter the one that's well fed. You're gonna leave the skinny thin one alone. You're gonna slaughter the one that has indulged. This is a pronouncement of judgment. God's not saying, listen, I'm going to throw, throw you into hell. But what he is saying is that there's going, to be strict, there's going to be a stricter judgment for those who have chosen, for those believers who are misusing their wealth. For those believers, remember the context, we're talking about believers. For those believers who have misused their wealth and have instead chose to indulge because of their own luxury. He says... They have fattened their hearts for the day of judgment. And this is going beyond mere pleasure to the point where it's a vice, as I said earlier. When we have to realize this, that when we indulge ourselves, the poor are being oppressed. When we indulge ourselves and we accumulate things that we don't really need, that means that somebody else is going without. Is this sermon convicting? Absolutely. Folks, the Holy Spirit of God is all over me in conviction. You understand what I'm saying? I'm preaching this to myself. And I'm getting convicted right now as I'm preaching it. To be honest with you. So what's my application? Covetousness pursues indulgence. Practice telling yourself no. How, have, you told, have you told yourself no lately? Just no. Well, I'd really like to have that. Well, do you know? You, no. I could get it. I've got the means to get it. But No. I've got three or four of those, but I don't have that color. No. Just practice telling yourself no. Again, I pray that you hear me in this. I'm not preaching legalism. God doesn't mind you having things. I like to bless my children as their father. I bless them with things. Because I, I like to see him smile. And God's a lot better father than I am. And God will bless us with things. He'll even bless us with our wants. And I believe that there's, there's times, I don't believe that, there, I believe that there's even times in our life where the Lord says, you know what? You've, you've been faithful. Indulge a little. Some of you may disagree with that, but you understand what I'm getting at? 
I'm not saying indulging to the point of, 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 of sin. But you've been faithful. You've been doing what God's asked you to do. You've been putting other people first. The reason I'm saying this is because some of us are the other extreme. Some of us won't do anything because we, because we feel guilty about anything. And so I'm trying to help those people have some freedom. There's some of you, there's some of you out there, you're like me. I'm just being honest. I got to tell myself no. I don't have the, you know what I'm saying? But my wife, she's the other way. I mean, I got to, I got to force her to get things for herself. I don't have a problem getting something for myself. You understand? Okay. Hey. But I got to force her to get things for herself. And so I'm trying to help those people who just feel guilty about every, if they go and get something. No, no, listen, it, it, the Lord's fine with those things. I'm not trying to put a yoke on you. But I'm telling you this. He's fine with, with it. Number one, when we've sought him and we've asked his permission. And number two, if we're being faithful in our lifestyle. We're being faithful with what we have, with our wealth, with our materials, we're being faithful with what we have to use it for His glory. Are you getting that? So, but for those of you who may be like me, practice telling yourself no. Covetousness practices betrayal. I conclude with this last point. He says, you have condemned, verse 6, you have condemned, you have murdered the righteous man, and he does not resist you. They've taken it to that point where they've condemned people. Now, some people, is murder literal or is it metaphoric in this passage? Well, throughout the book of James, he's used that word murder metaphorically. So if we're going to stay faithful to how James has used it throughout the book, then we would say that this is a metaphor. However, there are other people who would say, no, this needs to be translated literally. So let's talk about that for a moment. If, they, if, they're, if, they're li if it's literal murder, what he is saying is this. Because you are oppressing the poor by her holding back from them, they're dying. Because you are oppressing the poor and holding back, they're not having their needs met and they're dying. And it is murder. Or he could be saying because you are oppressing the poor... And they're not resisting you. You're holding back, giving them what they need. And I see that as murder. Not really that they're dying, but because of your attitude toward them. And your attitude toward your wealth. You Either way, what's the whole idea? The whole idea, the emphasis is not to be placed on the murder. The emphasis is to be placed on the oppression. Because, here's the idea, because you're not using your wealth to help other people, you are, they are oppressed. That's the idea. So, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9. It is, to me, it is unthinkable. To spend our days here on earth amassing and hoarding wealth knowing that the day of judgment draws near. Does that even make sense? The day of judgment draws near. It is unthinkable to, to think that, we, that we're going to spend our time hoarding and amassing wealth. We should be giving it away. Jesus said in Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I want to conclude with this. I think the message has been pretty clear, hasn't it? Here's what I want to say to you. Because some of you may say, well, Pastor, I've been blessed. And I have... I hope that some of... Maybe those of you who aren't giving regularly to the church... Were giving regularly, regularly to the ministry of the church... That God would use this message to convict you. And perhaps there's some adjustments that need to take place in your life... So that you can if I didn't say that to you, I wouldn't be a good pastor to you. You understand that? If these things are true, and when they are, and I don't say that, then I'm not being a good pastor to you. But here's what I want to say to you. This church has a vision. 
hear me now, I need everybody to listen. And I plan on being the pastor of this church for a long time. I know that ultimately that's up to God, okay? I'm just telling you what my plans are. And this church has a vision. We have a vision of connecting people to Christ, His church, His word, His mission for His glory. And we have a strategy, our connection groups. But our vision goes beyond just that. Our vision goes to this. Listen, this church right now is out of space for connection groups. We're running two Sunday schools right now, two connection groups. We're out of space. We don't, we don't, have, a lot of, we don't have any more room to start new groups. So are we going to be content with where we are and just cross our arms and say, we're just, we're just going to stay like this till Jesus comes back? Here's the vision. I, we've got a vision to build. A new building connecting those two wings in order to provide us with more connection group space in a, in a, in a larger fellowship hall so that we can all meet together for dinners. Amen? So we have a vision for, for a building so that, we can have new, so that we can start new units which will enable us to reach more people and, and minister to more people. And so we have a vision to build. But then we have a vision not only to build here on this site, we have a vision for purchasing land in the future and starting another church plant. Some of the greatest things that this church has ever done was to plant Waterloo Road Baptist Church and to plant Henderson Hills Baptist Church. Think about all the people that are being reached as a result of those two plants. And Edmund is growing. It's time for Mama to give birth again. Amen? To another baby. And we have a vision to support church planters all over North America and all over the world. We've got, we've got two church planters right now that we're committed to and three and, and a third one that we're, about to, that we're committed to, uh, not to the extent of the others, but we have plans to. I've got a church planning pastor friend of mine who feels called to Phoenix to plant a church. And he's been talking to me about coming alongside and helping them to... Because Phoenix is a very liberal area. Portland is a very liberal area. These are places that need strong churches. And so we're partnering with church planners right now to help these churches get started. So here's what I'm telling you. You want to invest in something that, 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 that has a passion for lostness? You want to give to something that has a passion to reach people with the gospel? You're already a part of it. It's your local church. Now, I can understand that it would be hard to invest in a church where they don't have a vision. Or they're not unified. But here's a church that is unified, that does have a vision, and our vision is to do everything that we, everything that we can and to take everything that we have to reach people for Jesus. Amen? Amen? And the only thing that will keep us from doing that? Covetousness. I want to ask if you would to bow your head this morning. My prayer is that the Lord will apply this sermon to you where you need it. I know He has done that to me. I pray that you would praise the Lord and thank the Lord that you're a part of a church that has a vision. And our vision is not about promoting ourselves. Our vision is about impacting lostness, reaching people with the gospel. I also want you to know this morning that the first step to anything is salvation. Some of you this morning, you may be all torn up inside about about giving and there's a dilemma going on and but listen none of this is really going to make sense to you if you're not saved so I want to know right now are you saved 
Has there been a point in time in your life where you've come before God in humble, broken repentance and say, God, I am sinful and I need your mercy. I need your grace. My sins are many and I need your forgiveness. I trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe that He is God's Son. I believe that He is your Son. And that He died on the cross for me. And that He was buried and He rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that He is risen. And I surrender my life to Jesus right now as my Lord and Savior. Dear friend, if you prayed this morning for salvation, here in a moment I'm going to ask for all of us to stand. And there's going to be pastors standing down front. And for those of you who prayed this morning to be saved, would you walk down here and walk up to one of these pastors and let us pray with you? We're not going to do anything to embarrass you. We just want to pray for you. Would you come? Here in a moment I ask you to stand. You come. Others of you this morning, you just need to pray for wisdom. Say, God, help me to, to know what you want me to do. I've got, I'm, con, I'm confused in my heart right now about what I should do concerning this message. And I need you to make some things clear for me. Maybe you just want to come and pray for clarity between you and God. Maybe you want to come and repent and tell the Lord you're sorry. By the way, that man I told you about at the beginning of that sermon, he chose to prime the pump. What are you going to choose to do? Take what you have and drink it. Miss out on the blessing and think little of others. Or are you going to take what you have and use it to prime the pump? Maybe you want to come and ask the Lord to help you with that this morning. Father in heaven, I pray for your spirit to be poured out among us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you